So the economy, of course, is what voters have on their mind as some 45 million Americans filed for unemployment since mid-March. So what does a successful economic recovery plan look like? Our next guest thinks he has the answer, or an answer anyway. Glenn Hubbard was President George W. Bush's economic advisor, and he's now a professor of finance and economics at Columbia University Business School. Looking at bipartisan solutions to the current crisis, and here he is telling our Walter Isaacson what he's come up with. Thank you, Chris John and Professor Glenn Hubbard. Welcome to the show. Thank you. You just put out a report, two Democrats, two Republicans, from the Aspen Economic Strategy Group, in which you talk about getting people back to work and the economy reopened. Why did you produce that report? Was there some dissatisfaction? with the way both political parties are handling this? Well, I think yes and no, if I can sound too much like an economist in saying that. Yes, in the sense that there's a huge bid ask spread between an enormous package suggested by Speaker Pelosi and some suggestions on the other side to do very little. So we felt the need for that. But also to remind people what this pandemic is about and how reopening happens and the kind of policies you need for that are very different from what we've done uh, in the past. How is the proposals that you all have made, this bipartisan set of proposals, different from the CARES Act and PPP? Partly it's about flexibility. These proposals involve triggers, depending on how high unemployment is or how bad an economic situation is. So for example, if you're optimistic, if you think there's a V-shaped recovery, the proposals we suggest won't cost nearly as much as if you think they're pessimistic. But our view is, our leaders don't know, we economists don't know exactly what we're looking at. We need to be flexible. Second, we would move away from PPP toward more general small business support through lending programs, some of which the Federal Reserve is trying to stand up, and by supporting work with more flexible unemployment insurance benefits, but also uh, doubling the earned income tax credit uh, during this period, really to support low wage work. Uh, we also would provide state and local governments a block grant that help public education, to help their health care systems. You know, state and lo local governments have had a big revenue hit just like business and need that support. All together in an optimistic recovery is about a trillion dollars. You say you'd provide help to state and local governments, aid to them. Does that end up costing a lot of money or do you think that pays off in the long run? Well, it certainly will cost money in the near term. We're suggesting a $500 billion block grant, which is similar to the proposals from the National Governors Association and others. But it, we think it's very effective. The multiplier on stopping the job losses, the output losses of states is very, very high. Uh, we have learned that in previous recessions, and we think it's very important. There's a political debate on how states may or may not have gotten themselves into trouble for a variety of reasons. But we think you can, you can tailor this approach to avoid that discussion right now and come back to it later. In making these proposals, you're one of the two Republican uh, members of this report. You worked for uh, George Bush 43. Did you work with the White House in doing this, or do you find it more useful to work with Republican leaders in Congress? Well, I've certainly uh, tried to answer any questions the White House might have and work with them. Uh, I think they're on a similar page. Uh, much of the work I have done personally has been with Republican leaders in the Congress. Do you think that the White House and administration have been effective in administering the original PPP program? I think there were a number of hiccups in the PPP program, some of which were from complications and it's a tough time, but some of them for, were for rules that just weren't in the legislation that I think frustrated PPP. I think the Paycheck Protection Program is, is now off to a much better resolution than it started, but more work needs to be done. I'm focusing my attention on the Main Street Lending Facility, which is the new lending version of that. That, too, is suffering from some hiccups and needs a lot of help. What hiccups are they suffering from in helping people on Main Street and, and the businesses on Main Street? Well, I think the program as designed is uh, trying not to lose money. And in the middle of a financial crisis, uh, lending to small and mid-sized businesses, you are going to lose money. If you don't lose money, that means you're just not setting it up to lend to people who need it. So I think we have to get past that mindset. There are a number of, of changes in the weeds that would make banks more eager to participate and make small businesses more eager to borrow. 
And I think the Fed is attuned to that. Keep in mind, this is not something the Fed has done before. It was thrown in the Fed's lap. But if the Fed's going to use a word like Main Street, they need to do it right. The Fed has a lot of money still left over, doesn't it, from the original uh, set of appropriations uh, or uh, budget. Uh, why have they not used it? Well, that's a very good question. They were appropriated $454 billion in the CARES Act to stand up a number of these facilities, one of which is Main Street. And they have been slow to do that. Again, part of it is not wanting to lose the money. But if Congress appropriated that money, they obviously expected there was some risk of loss or wouldn't have done it. The Treasury Secretary has signed off, giving the people's blessing. Uh, so I think the Fed needs to pick up its speed a little in getting the Main Street program off the ground. So how would you have your new program be different so that it could really help Main Street? Because you've written in the Wall Street Journal that Main Street's getting slammed, you know, small businesses are getting slammed, and it's not being administered correctly to help well, it's a, it's a very good question. I, right now, small business is in a lot of trouble in the reopening phase, and it needs a different kind of help than it did during the shutdown phase. The Main Street program could help by lending to businesses that would have been credit worthy just prior to the onset of COVID-19. That requires banks doing their underwriting, but it also means that banks shouldn't be punished for every loan that goes bad. Borrowers need a lot of flexibility uh, in the use uh, of the funds. And I think there's some suggestions that we offer in the report. We're not trying to be prescriptive, but just things the Fed might want to consider if it sets up the program and no one comes. One of the things in your report was that you want to use loan guarantees done by banks. And that, you said, was so that uh, we really could have a test to say, are these businesses viable or not? Why did you make that change from the original type of program we had? Well, the original program we had, of course, was effectively grants uh, to businesses. As we enter a phase where people are going back to work, really the question is giving businesses credit to get back uh, on their feet. And we think that the loan guarantee approach will get banks involved and get them involved in their underwriting, but really put the losses mainly on the treasury uh, if the economy is weak. In your report, you also talk about uh, worry about disincentives to work, that sometimes you can design a program and it'll sort of be paying people not to work. How did you try to fix that? Well, in the CARES Act, there was a, a lump sum federal unemployment insurance payment on top of state payments that would have been above the wage of work for many Americans. So what we suggested was doing it as a percentage replacement so that that problem does not uh, arise, and particularly during a time where we hope people are going to be going back to work. We're reopening the economy. The last thing we want to do is a disincentive. So we want to support people going back to work, but not in a way that provides perverse incentives. And we, we think we've done that. We've also linked it to triggers for each state's unemployment rate, because this reopening is going to be varied across the country in how easy it is. Well, let me get specific. It was about $600 weekly, right? That Correct. That happened before. What are y'all doing now? It would be a uh, percentage replacement rate that would get people up to about 80 to 90% of the average wage, around $400 uh, at most for, for most people. So smaller, but still a very significant replacement. And remember, this is on top of the traditional unemployment insurance would you do things like uh, increase uh, what are called food stamps or those type of programs to make sure that the people really uh, suffering now uh, were, had a better safety net? Yes, we did suggest uh, increasing support during this period for the SNAP uh, program that provides food assistance for low-income Americans. We thought there were a number of things in this proposal uh, involving SNAP, involving the Earned Income Tax Credit and other programs that probably are good reforms generally, but we think in this context, they're particularly important. One of the things COVID has done is shown a light on the hardships many low Americans face going to work. Well, yeah, the low income Americans are the ones who've gotten particularly slammed during yes. this, and especially African Americans have been slammed by this, and then the George Floyd protests sort of shatter their faith in our society. Yes. What are you doing uh, for that type of structural inequality? Well, we've advocated a pandemic earned income tax credit that would double 
the earned income tax credit during the period of the pandemic. But frankly, some of us as co-authors have in our own work recommended a big expansion of the earned income tax credit to childless workers in general. We need to be doing more to support low wage work in the country. That's gonna be obviously particularly important for some groups in the population, but frankly, if people aren't on the ladder of work, they can't move up. As a society, if we believe in opportunity, we really need to do this. And the rate of return on that investment is very, very high. Give me some examples from your own work of how you try to focus on getting people to be able to move up the economic ladder. Well, I think there are a couple of things. Uh, let's talk about preparation and the work itself. In terms of preparation, the unsung heroes in the country here are community colleges. And yet community colleges have had their funding cut in many states for a very long time. Part of what we're doing in this proposal is offering a block grant of support to community colleges and public universities to restore that. There are some people who talk about, quote, free college, but that doesn't provide the money to the states to stand up the community college. So I think that's an empty promise. A better promise is to say, let's support what community colleges are trying to do for training. Then once people work, let's support low wage work. So the thesis of the earned income tax credit, of course, is that if I'm working, I get extra support that makes my reward to work higher than its private market value. That's what the EITC, earned income tax credit does. It needs to be more generous. And it needs to support childless workers who are young people just starting out. So I think if we focus on preparation, and we focus on work support, we'll have done a lot of good, not just in the pandemic, but in our economy in general. This is all gonna cost a lot of money. I know in your report, you say the money can, you know, is a wide range depending on how fast the recovery comes and how fast we defeat uh, the coronavirus. But how are we gonna afford these things? Are you worried now about the deficit that we're racking up? Of course I'm worried, but I begin by always asking myself, What's the counterfactual? Doing nothing isn't feasible. The economic loss that we would face without these interventions is very large. That's why we wrote the report. So a trillion dollars is a lot of money, and it could even be two trillion if the recovery is weaker, but it would be harder still for the government if we did nothing. This is like a war, and in a war, one borrows a lot of money and then pays it back later. There will be a day of reckoning. We will have to have a discussion of fiscal reform, of taxes, of spending, to pay for this and a number of government promises. But in the middle of the war, the goal should be to win it. The president just floated the idea of another stimulus check, just sending out another check to people. That's not in your proposal. What do you think of that? And do you think there are better ways to be doing this? Well, I could certainly make an argument for doing that, depending on the shape of the recovery, but we felt in our proposal that we were focused on the reopening. And in a reopening world, there'll be opportunities for people to go back to work. And so what we wanna do is support that. And for people who aren't as fortunate to be back to work quickly, support them through the unemployment insurance system, through short-time compensation and other programs. Unemployment is now up at 14%. There's some people who just may never get their jobs back. What do you do for them? Well, the recovery is going to be slow uh, for employment. If you look at the Congressional Budget Office's forecast, even a year from now, we could be at 9% plus unemployment. So we will need cyclical support for people for quite a while. But the deeper part of your question is how do we prepare people whose jobs just may not come back or who may need to retrain for something else? And I think that's really about support to attend community colleges or other institutions that focus on that, and then support for re-entry into work, expansions of the earned income tax credit uh, and programs like that. Those uh, issues were, of course, present before COVID, but I think COVID has accentuated. Uh, there's been a spike in cases, uh, especially in places like Florida that reopened are you worried that businesses are gonna to have to reclose, close down again, and can we reclose the economy again? Well, I think businesses are very worried about that, which is why there's such an emphasis on safety. Many employers, long after regulation says they can do something, are likely to move much slower as a result. So I, I think irrespective of what regulation allows, employers are gonna go slowly until they figure this out. To completely reshut the economy again would be an economic calamity. 
we really need to avoid that. And the way to avoid that is by being careful and measured and reasonable in the reopening. We sometimes say, especially down here in New Orleans, when we have a hurricane that a crisis uh, shouldn't be wasted. Uh, what type of structural changes would you do to America and its economy and its workforce uh, coming out of this pandemic? Well, part of it is about preparing people and supporting work. I think that was a problem long before COVID-19, but COVID-19 really shone a light on, on how unequal that preparation is and how unequal that support is. I think it's time for that kind of, uh, that kind of structural reform. And it's also time to reform the way we think about labor market policies generally. You know, programs like unemployment insurance were designed in the 1930s for losing your job for a short period of time and then getting it right back. And we know for years that many of the transitions in the labor market are much more structural, and we need a different way of dealing with them. Hopefully, one of the side effects, if you will, of COVID might be shining a light on the need for those kinds of policies. Professor Glenn Hubbard, thank you for joining us tonight on the show. My pleasure. Thank you.